Recently, F-Stoppers released a couple videos comparing the most popular battery-powered speed lights on the market, but there is one test that we did not include in those reviews, and that is how do these perform when using a global shutter at extremely fast shutter speeds? In this video, I'm gonna test all five of these popular strobes to see which one gives you the most bang for your buck when shooting with a global shutter as found on the Sony A9 III. Now, if you're watching this video, I assume that you're really into photography. And if you're a photographer, F-Stoppers is hosting a photography contest every month called Critique the Community. Anybody can enter, anyone can upload their photos, and at the end of every month, we share 10 images, we give our opinions on what makes them great, what could be improved, and at the end, three random photographers will win some incredible photography-related prizes. Sometimes they're digital cameras, lenses, lighting gear, or just photography-related software. And third place always wins a free photography tutorial from the F-Stopper store. This critique is always free to enter and you can learn more at fstoppers.com contest or through the link in the description below. Now, as I mentioned, our channel recently did a very comprehensive video where Lee Morris did a hands-on comparison of the five most popular flashes made for professional photographers. If you haven't checked out that video yet, I've put a link to that comparison at the end of this video. Now, over the last few months, I've kind of been obsessed with the new Sony A9 III mirrorless camera because it's the first full frame mirrorless camera that has a global shutter, which allows you to sync flash at any shutter speed. This is a huge deal for photographers, and it's one of the most exciting new features that I've seen in many years. Since we have all of these units here in our studio, I wanted to find out how they performed when pushing them beyond the typical max shutter sync speed and find out which one of these might give you the biggest benefit when trying to overpower your scene's ambient light. The flashes that I have here are displayed in cheapest to most expensive. We have the newer Z2, the Godox V1, the Westcott FJ82, the Sony HVL F60 RM2, what a title. And then finally we have the Profoto A10. In the previous comparison that Lee did, we found that the differences in max power settings between all of these flashes was only six tenths of a stop. The way we found this is we set the newer Z2 as the base control at zero, and we found that the Westcott had one third of a stop less power, while the Sony had about one third stop more power. The Godox and the Profoto lights were almost identical to the newer, so really the range wasn't that great, even though there was a little bit of a difference. However, when you're using a global shutter, where your shutter speeds are extremely fast, it isn't the total full power output of the flash that determines how bright it will register in your scene, but instead it's how much power can be dumped in the fastest amount of time. This measurement is called your flash duration. Here is a chart representing the flash output as it travels across time. The total time of this flash pop is 1 over 673rd of a second, and if you're using a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second, the entire flash pop is going to be faster than your shutter speed. But if we start increasing our shutter speed to times faster than our flash duration, say one over 80,000th of a second, we are now going to cut off some of the flash because our shutter is now faster than the flash itself. In the past, this really wasn't an issue because none of us were able to shoot with shutters that were faster than our flash's flash duration. Now, the interesting thing is we can control what section of the flash duration we use in our exposure and it should be pretty obvious, we want to sync our shutter to the part of the flash that has the most amount of light, and that is going to be this area here, and not this area here. And what's pretty cool about the Sony A9 III is it allows us to pick the exact moment we capture on the camera with a specialized flash timing setting found in the menu. Picking this correct timing in the menu makes a huge difference in how much flash is captured during the exposure on a global shutter. You can see here from my test shots, you can perfectly time it to capture the most amount of flash possible or you can miss the flash entirely. As you can imagine, the challenge with using flash with a global shutter is going to be getting everything to line up perfectly. First, every single flash is going to have a completely unique flash duration curve at each different power setting. So settings that work at one half power won't necessarily work when you stop them down to 1 16th power. Second, the length of your shutter speed is going to affect how much of the flash you ultimately capture. A shutter speed of 1 25th of a second is going to capture the entire flash duration, but if we change it to 1 8,000th of a second, we're just going to capture a very small amount of the flash, where an extremely fast flash duration like 1 80,000th of a second will only capture a tiny sliver of the flash's total output. 
So basically changing your flash's output up or down and changing your camera's shutter speed almost always requires changing the flash timing settings. Hopefully that all makes sense so far. Now for the super frustrating part. <laughs> In order to find out which flash has the fastest flash duration with also the largest amplitude or flash output, I unfortunately had to test every single flash timing setting at different power settings and different shutter speeds for all five of these different flash units. As you can imagine, this takes a ton of time, literally hours, to shoot, record, and process each one of these setting changes. So to make this manageable, I only focused on two different shutter speeds for this specific test, one eight thousandth of a second and one eighty thousandth of a second. Because I'm such a nice guy, if you pause this video, you can copy down the perfect settings for all of these flashes, and next time you're in Puerto Rico, maybe you just buy me a mojito. Now let's talk about some of the results that I found doing this test. And the first one really isn't that surprising to me because I've done this a few times in the last month, and that is the total exposure captured by the camera when the flash is set to full power or one quarter power is exactly the same. The reason for this is because at extremely fast shutter speeds, we are only capturing a small portion of the flash power. As we move the power down from full power to quarter power, the flash duration might change fairly significantly, but when we adjust the sync timing for maximum exposure, we are still only capturing the absolute highest amplitude while ignoring the rest of the flash power within that flash duration. In other words, basically we are always throwing away a ton of the actual flash released and only recording a tiny fraction of it. So what this means is that you do not gain any advantage in exposure when shooting at full power versus stopping down to one quarter power. And all five of these flashes showed exactly this when I shot at the same shutter speeds at full power, half power, and quarter power. This means you can save a ton of battery power and have faster recycle rates by setting your flash down to one quarter power instead of shooting at full power. Now I need to say there might be a random flash out there where this is not true, so you really need to test this yourself, but this was consistent over all five of these flashes in the tests that I conducted. Now let's look at how these flashes compared side by side at the same power settings and at the same shutter speeds. Here's a Photoshop stack that I created of all five flashes stacked on top of each other in order from weakest to strongest, with my shutter set to 1 8,000th of a second. By comparing the histogram and the overall exposure, we can see that the newer Z2 was the darkest, the Profoto A10 was marginally better, while the Godox, it came out right in the middle. The Sony flash was about a third of a stop brighter than the Godox, and while the Westcott's histogram looks slightly lower, the overall frame to me looks a tad brighter, so I think it performed the best in this test, but it is pretty close. The zoom on all of these flashes was set to 70 millimeters, but obviously not all of them are throwing exactly perfectly even light. You can really see the vignetting on some of these frames, and the Sony flash does expose the black area of my chart more than the Westcott, but the overall Sony frame is still a little bit darker. The difference between the Sony and the Westcott flashes is super close and probably really not worth nitpicking over. The overall difference between the newer flash, which was the darkest, and the Westcott flash, which was the brightest, was only about one half stop difference. Not a huge difference, but a difference nonetheless. Now, before I move on to our 1 80,000th of a second test, there's a few things I want to mention. First, the Westcott flash is the only flash in this entire group that has a freeze option, which makes the flash duration extremely fast, but at the expense of a correct white balance. Many other studio strobes that I have and work with, they have this freeze option, but none of these speed lights do, except for the Westcott FJ82S. In all of these tests, the Westcott strobe was set into this freeze mode to give it the best performance. Also, because it's just kind of interesting to me, when I used my light meter to record all the flash durations, the Westcott flash duration charts looked really weird, and for some reason, they did not have the same initial peak that trailed off, but instead had multiple peaks and valleys. I don't know why it looks so strange compared to all of the other traditional flash curves that I've seen, but kind of interesting. If any of you guys know why it looks like this, I'd be interested to know. So here are the results when I started shooting at 1 80,000th of a second. And just like the previous test, I fired all of these at full power too, but the results at one quarter power were the same. So that's what we're looking at here in this test. Now this time the Profoto A10, it fell into last place, followed by the newer Z2. Then we had the Godox V1. Next is the Westcott FJ82. 
And in this test, the Sony had a notable advantage here. The difference between the Sony in first place and the Pro Photo in last place is now about three quarters of a stop. So a little bit more of a difference than the previous test at one eight thousandth of a second. Now what's interesting is based on the power test that we did in Lee's video, we found the Westcott flash to be the weakest followed by the Pro Photo, then the newer, then Godox, and the Sony was the most powerful. For the most part, this same trend was true when using a global shutter, except in one situation, the Westcott was the least powerful flash, but now when using a global shutter, it has become the most powerful flash or maybe tied with Sony, and perhaps this is because it has this special freeze mode built into it. Again, freeze mode creates a faster flash duration, which along with total power output are the two features that we want in a test like this. So what's my overall conclusion from this test? Well, there is no doubt that the Sony F60 RM2 is the best flash when using ultra fast shutter speeds. Another interesting thing about the Sony flash is that the camera and the flash communicate perfectly with each other and you don't have to calculate these timing modes in the menu at all. In fact, when I let the camera pick out the timing automatically, the exposure was actually brighter than when I manually picked it with the best time based on my images. I'm not sure if somehow Sony internally allows the adjustment to be even smaller than the 20 milliseconds, but the exposures did turn out perfect every single time. So if you use the Sony flash with the Sony camera, this solves a huge problem of having to test and record your timing settings manually. Unfortunately, if you decide to buy one of the third party flashes, you are going to have to take hundreds of photos like I did and discover the best timing adjustment that matches up with the highest exposure. Having to do this takes a ton of time and is a huge pain in the butt. Now for the bad news. If you watched Lee's previous videos where he compares all of these, he and I are both in agreement that the Sony flash is our least favorite, mainly because of the clunky bounce flash design and the hard to use and archaic looking menu built into the user interface. I also found that the recycle times at full power on this flash were much slower than this, probably because it uses AA batteries, where all of these other flashes use lithium batteries, which just recycle way faster. So while the Sony flash did win this experiment, I still don't think I would be happy using this as a professional photographer. It is my least favorite flash out of all five of these. Now the Westcott FJ82S flash is the second best performing flash when using a global shutter. It also has the freeze mode, which can be incredibly useful for other flash applications where you might need to freeze action with say a traditional sync speed. I also really like the touch LCD screen on this. So for me, this is probably the flash that I would go to if syncing with high shutter speeds using a global shutter was important to me and I could only buy one of these flashes. Now that being said, the real truth of the matter is that all of these flashes performed within one half to three quarters of a stop. And I'm not really sure that anyone should use this test as a basis for which one of these flashes that they wanna buy, at least not this test alone. Now this isn't really the results that I came into hoping to see. I wanted in my mind for these flashes to fall all over the place and for there to be one clear winner, but when looking at real science and coming in this with a non-biased point of view, that's what the results show, and so that's what the results are. Now, one final thought that I'll leave you with is that I also added a Profoto B10X Plus in this test, since I have one here in my studio, and I was curious to see how this huge flash would perform compared to all of these small speed lights. On paper, this is significantly more powerful. And when I did my own light meter test two different ways, I'm getting one and a half stops more power. However, when I found the perfect sync timing for this flash at these same shutter speeds, the overall exposure improvement with this huge flash was only about one half of a stop brighter at both one eight thousandth of a second and one eighty thousandth of a second. So it appears once you start cranking your shutter speed up to these insane shutter speeds, the power advantage that larger strobes offer doesn't always translate for this specific application. Until I can run this same test with the $18,000 Profoto Pro 11 pack, which has one of the fastest flash durations on the market, maybe, just maybe, the perfect battery powered strobe to use with a global shutter is actually 
one of these here in this test. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you want more content like this, make sure you subscribe to our channel and head over to fstoppers.com for daily articles and reviews. If you wanna check out our full-length photography tutorials on all sorts of different genres of photography, head over to fstoppers.com store, where you can find video education on everything from landscapes, weddings, product photography, architecture, and macro photography, and a whole lot more. And don't forget to submit your best images for our next Critique the Community at fstoppers.com slash contest or through the link in the description below. After a really nerdy test like this, I need a little bit of a break, but I will see you guys really, really soon.